Paul's Mall is known as one of the most notorious and dangerous prisons in the world. What were the conditions like back then? Prison was still was that time the same type of prison, but Mandela and them was isolated alone on the roof of the maximum security prison, not mixed with other prisoners, totally kept alone. <laughs> Are you ready? Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. What's up, everybody? My name is Joshua Rubin, and this is the Wide Awake Podcast. Today, my guest is Christo Brandt. He was Nelson Mandela's warden on Robben Island and also in Paulsma Prison until Mandela's release in 1990. Welcome to the studio. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here with you today. <laughs> Amazing. So, I mean, let's just get straight into it, I think. I was born in 1996 after apartheid. Okay. So I only know what it was like through reading and documentaries. I wanted to know from you, what was the South Africa like during apartheid? I grew up on a farm, you know, where I didn't see or realize anything about apartheid. When we moved to the city in 1972, that's for the first time I start seeing I don't have black friends or colored friends to play with. Then I realized in 1976, it was an uprising in South Africa. I didn't understand what the uprising is about. Till I start work on Robben Island. Then I found out these guys of 76 was also sentenced in that year and sent with me to Robben Island. So I met these uprising students on Robben Island as prisoners. And what was it like, like daily life? Obviously, black people, colored people, Indian people and white people were all treated very differently. And um, I mean, what was that like? Because we know what it's like today. Everyone has the same or relatively the same pri privileges. But what was it like walking around and getting on a bus and having different seats for black and white people and just other stuff, you know? You know, when I walk, when I get on a train station, I want to rush to a toilet and there's toilets for whites and blacks. And, uh, and so that day I could have not made it for a white toilet. I ran into the black's toilet. And when I came out, my friend said, you was in the wrong toilet. I said, what is the difference? Why it might matter? Toilets look the same inside. Then I started realizing about there's toilets for blacks, there's toilets for whites. On the, on the train was first class for whites, third class for blacks. I didn't understand what it means. I was too young to understand it. Like I said, when I started working, I started realizing that about these things. And how old were you when you started working on Robben when I, Island? When I started work on Robben Island, I was 18 years old that year. That's the same year Mandela turned 60 years old. Jeez, that's incredible. Hey, I mean, that's, that's actually quite insane. And uh, how long was he in prison for after you met him? How many years did he still have left? Okay, that year when I arrived on Robben Island, Mandela was already 14 years in prison. And then after that, he was... The other outstanding years of his 27 years was in prison, yes. I was just, you can say, from 1978 with him till he was released in 1990. There was quite a time. But where I become very closer to him was at Paulsmoor Prison, mm. where they was totally isolated away from all other prisons, prisoners, and only four of them was being kept in Paulsmoor Prison. Six months later, they sent another gentleman, Ahmed Khathradra, there, which was also in prison with him. So I dealt with five prisoners on, on a big section you know, on a daily basis. Must have been such an interesting experience. I mean, heartbreaking as well, but just looking back, you were a part of such a big piece of history. Uh, I mean, before we get to that, how did you get the job on Robben Island? What happened during apartheid? All white children was forced for military training. So one of my friends was sent for training the year before me. He was sent to the borders and was killed by so-called terrorists. And I still remember that day when we sat in a church. I remember when we see my friend off in a station, he said to me, you not want to join the military. He don't want to fight black people in the townships or on the borders and in, 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 in all that. And then he was killed by those people. And then it was sad for me when a priest said, what hero this gentleman was, was for our country. I knew this gentleman didn't want to join the military and he was not a hero. And he said, they're protecting our against the black enemy. The blacks was not my enemy. And I made the decision I would look for something alternative not to join the military. But what happened in my last year on school, grade 12, I get my letter for military intake early the year. And three months before I left school, a gentleman visited our school and looking for people and guard prisoners. I wasn't interested to become a prison guard of the quality warder that year. I wasn't interested in that. Till he mentioned exemption from military service. Then I think I will have a conversation with this guy. After a conversation, I said to him, I don't really want to become a prison warden of a guard. I want to become an electrician. He said, that's a right opportunity to choose. 
Become a prison guard. After your training, you apply to work in a prison workshops. Become electrician. You can help prisoners become electricians. That's how I signed up. Become a prison guard. And can you explain to the people that don't know what Robben Island is, what it actually is? I know, I know all the South Africans will know, but if there's anyone watching from overseas, what is Robben Island? Robben Island was a place for incarceration. That is a place where they kept all the political people together. All males, black, colored of Indian. No whites was been kept there and no females was been kept there. That was a place of hardship. That was a place where prisoners doing hard labor daily. If prisoners don't work, they will be beaten to work or take by force out to work or they will be punished in isolation with no food. They will be punished. And that is where prisoners was pushed to do hard labor. And was Robben Island built specifically to hold these prisoners? Was it a prison before apartheid? Before apartheid, it was a prison for many, many years. From the 1600s, Jan van Riebeek came there and have da- slaves, where the Dutch working with the slaves in that stone quarry where they break the stones, breaking stones to build the first face of the castle in Cape Town. And that was first day. Then it becomes also after that more Khoi people was being arrested and sent there. Leaders was being kept away. There was a guy from Madura, the Indian guy, a Muslim guy, was also incarcerated there. Then after that it became a leper colony from the 1800s till the beginning of the 1900s, a leper colony, where our people were sent with leprosy of their belief. They uh, looked like diseases on them. They become leprosy patients. And then it closed as a leprosy place and there was, uh, all the buildings was burned down. Then the military take over and after the military was also the Navy take over Robben Island. That was after the Second World War, they start planning to put up some cannons and things on the island, but it was too late for the war. At that time, in the late 60s, beginning 60s, 58, 59, it becomes a prison where the Navy used some prisoners and then prison department take over Robben Island in 1960. And then it becomes a prison for only murderers in prison with long sentences. And Mandela was also arrested for the first time in 1963 in a place called Howick, Durban, when he left the country illegally. And he was sent to Robben Island for a sentence of five years. And that five years he was sent with criminal prisoners, murderers, rapists, in that cell where they're breaking blue rock to start build the first phase of the maximum security prison. And while he was there, the writer farm in Johannesburg in a suburb of Ravonia, the farm was called Lily's Leaf. There they arrested his comrades and they found documentation and things of Mandela. Then he was been taken off the island again and charged for high treason. End of the day, he get life imprisonment. That was a celebration for them. They was expecting the death sentence. On the 12th of June, 1964, they were sentenced for life imprisonment. They put them on planes that night and fly them to Robben Island. The 13th of June, 1964, early hours in the morning, the planes land on the island and then Mandela was being taken to the new maximum security prison, which was half built. So he'd been taken to that prison. And on that island, he spent 18 years of his life sentence. I heard, I was reading a lot about Nelson Mandela last night, and I heard he was a master of evading the law enforcement. They were saying that he was eventually, when he was eventually captured, he was captured in a, I think it was a butler's outfit. Um, and he, he would also dress up as like a chef, a, a chauffeur, a butler, to kind of sneak under the radar and, and evade police. Is, is that true? I th- I, that can be true, yes. I know Cathrada was also dressed up like um, a Portuguese guy with big glasses and things like that. People didn't recognize him at all. Who you is know, Cathadra? Cathrada was one of the co-accused which was sentenced with Mandela for life. He was also Mandela's advisor in parliament, a member of parliament and so on. He was the one who declared Robben Island with President Mandela as a museum, a living museum. After it's closing. After it closed 1996, yes. And did anyone ever escape Robben Island? Did any prisoners ever break out? In the early years, there were some escapes. Chief Makoma have escaped and things like that. But and during the time when Mandela was in Robben Island, there was no escapes from the political people because Mandela always said, we never escape from this place. The more we can prepare us for freedom, we educate ourselves. But remember, if you escape and the police arrested you, you will be tortured till death. How can you fight the struggle if you're dead? You know, never escape. But there was a criminal escape where a criminal prisoner with under 18 months sentence escaped from Robben Island to the deep sea. He was a lifesaver. The government didn't worry to look for him because he was not a serious case. He was in for non-support or things like that. Very light sentence he have. And did they ever find him? 
they never go and look for him to find him. Okay. Well, I hope he escapes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I mean, these days, Robben Island is a tourist attraction for locals and tourists to go to. But back in the day, it was very different. I mean, what was the atmosphere like on Robben Island while it was an active prison? What was the, the, the tension like between prisoners and wardens? In that year, when it was Robben Island during the time when there was a prison, there was a community of guards staying on the island. There's 50, 95 houses on the island. There was guards about 200 to 300 in the single quarters. And we socialized with each other on the island. We've got a recreation hall where we watch movies on Wednesday nights and Friday nights. We sometimes have sockies and dances on the island. Saturdays, we have got some rugby matches against other prisoners on the island. And, and, and the ladies was playing tennis. There's some people playing tennis. There's tennis courts on the island. So you would play rugby with the prisoners? No, no, not with the prisoners. Okay. That is the guards <laughs> with the guards. Okay. They never play with the prisoners. Prisoners were totally separate on the other side mm. of the island. They could have played some sports on weekends where they play soccer mostly and later also some rugby. And some prisoners also play some tennis. Like in a section of Mandela, they never played rugby. But they kicked the ball sometimes a little bit around. But it was mostly they concentrate on tennis, quay, um, tennis and things like that in the section, yes. And when you first started working there, who did you think you would be guarding? Who did they tell you, you're now a warden and these are the prisoners you're going to be guarding? Who did you think that you would be taken care of? When I started working with Robin, they told us we're going to meet the biggest criminals in the history of South Africa. I was expecting gangsters, tattoo faces and things like that. And why I was choose to be on Robin Island, that is closer to home. If I was stationed in a Transvaal far from Cape Town, I could have seen my family once a year. At least from Robin Island, I could have seen them every fortnight if it was possible when I weekend off. But um, when I get on the island, they told us about the biggest criminals. But when I open that first cell door that morning, I see an elderly old man stand up from the floor, slept on two mats, three blankets, stand bare feet on a cold cement, short pants and short sleeves. And he greet me with respect. I look at his face and his body immediately in his legs. I don't see any tattoos on his body. And I could have not believed that can be a gangster. That must have been quite shocking because I can't imagine, you know, as a young, young kid, really, to be told you're going to be looking after or taking care of or guarding some of the biggest criminals in our history. And then you get there and it's a bunch of, you know, old men who are very polite. That must have been quite shocking to see. It was shocking to see to guarding old men. You know, I must feel sorry for these guys. When I see how these guys work and how they go on their knees on the cement to polish the floors, it was feel very bad for me at that stage to see how old people was be treated in prison. And how were they treated? Like, what was their daily life like? Daily life, five o'clock in the morning, a bell ring to awake the prisoners. Six o'clock, the guards will just come and have a look through the windows. If the prisoners is busy preparing themselves, getting themselves ready to be open up. And then quarter to seven, we will open the doors that the prisoners could have taken the toilet bucket to the community toilets to clean, wash and put in a courtyard. And then um, you can see half past seven, we march these prisoners out of prison to the limestone quarry of different workspaces on the island. And there they will stay till, say, at half past quarter to four. Then we march them back to prison. Then we get a, a time for them to settle in, get their food, get their buckets into the cells before we lock them up. Five o'clock, all prisoners must be locked up. So it was a lot of hard labor. There was a whole lot of hard labor, you know. Government was also thinking about what type of labor they can think out for prisoners. Like Mandela and the leadership, they try to keep the leaders away from the ordinary other prisoners. Especially when a group of prisoners come in and identify the leader between them. The leader will be totally removed from them. And that leader won't see his comrades again. The leaders was totally put separately. You know, there was people served 15 years on, 15 years on Robben Island. They have never seen Nelson Mandela, which was also serving there during that time. So strict was security to keep them away from each other. But um, it was hard to see some of this, like I said, the old people working on their knees, scrape the floors, polish the floors, clean the courtyard. And their places was always clean. You can walk in that cells, you always have a good clean smell. Never smell a, like a real criminal prison. The match is stinking and smelling. You never dirtiness of written writings on the walls or things like that. These prisoners haven't done that at all. Because I'm sure a lot of the people that were arrested were political activists like Nelson Mandela, where 
they weren't your average criminals. These were extremely highly educated people that were fighting for something that should have been theirs already, you know, their freedom. Um, I, I wanted to know, when was the first time you saw Nelson Mandela? You know, the first time I saw Nelson Mandela was that first day, but I didn't know Nelson Mandela. I just see the names Walter Susulu, Andrew Mlangeni, Nelson Mandela was just a name and prisoners. I, you know, that's all. I, I've seen him that first day. I should have seen him because I opened the cells. But you didn't know who he was. I didn't know who he was. Only when I started working in the census office, then I realized who is Nelson Mandela. Especially that year, you get many birthday cards, 55,000 from all over the world. He received 55,000 you know, birthday for cards. For his 60th birthday. Wow. Then I know he must be something very special. <laughs> you know, that's why I asked the sergeant, when we only found out there's only 12 cards from South Africa, I asked the sergeant, but why 12 from South Africa? Don't South Africans not know Nelson Mandela? His answer to me was, he said, Brandt, if anybody in South Africa dared to send a card for Nelson Mandela, and the police identified that person, that person should have been immediately arrested, 90 days so solid confinement, electrical shock, tortured, maybe killed, maybe totally disappeared. People in South Africa was afraid to correspond with these people on the Robben Island. I'm surprised that they delivered cards to them, even from outside of South Africa. That's quite surprising. You know, there was a celebration for his 60th birthday in the UK, I understand. And there was people made aware of Nelson Mandela. There was one gentleman by the name Indris Naidu. When he left Robben Island after 10 years in prison, he skipped the country, go out to Germany in, in London. He was the one who made Mandela's name a life, arrange a concert for the freedom fighters on Robben Island. And then I celebrate Mandela's birthday. That's so beautiful. And um, when you looked at Nelson Mandela, did you see a terrorist like so many other people said he was? When I look at Nelson Mandela, I just see him as an elderly old person in the prison, do all the instructions and things he was being given. He was a person treat people with respect. He was a humble person, down to earth person. He didn't have that fighter, fight, fight in himself. He will fight with paper and pen. If he not agree or something, he will put in a report and put it on paper. He won't verbally discuss it with the person and want to report back like that. That was how we fight people. He always said that his biggest weapon was education. And um, I know that's a big part of your story as well. He, he was encouraging you to get educated as well. Um, but I want to know how often would prisoners be allowed to get visits on Robben Island? You know, when Mandela came on Robin in 1964, he was allowed one visit every six months for 30 minutes by one person. Later years, it had been improved. When I came on Robben Island, that year you already get one visit every three months for 30 minutes. But then two or three years after that, things became improved more. Then he was allowed two visits a month, but said maybe 24 a year, said 20 a year or 12 a year. He can take his two visits every month, but after six months, he don't have visits left in a year. He must have a quota system. And then he was allowed also on a time with two people. And then I know 1984, after he get his first contact visit, they allowed children for the first time to visit prisoners on Robin Island. Not Robin Island, but in Portsmouth Prison. Then they allowed that. And then contact visits come in for first degree family, like wives and, and uh, parents like that. Before prisoners were allowed to have visits with children. I know that there was very strict rules against that. No kids were allowed on the island, uh, especially from people like family members of prisoners. Um, you told a story about a time where Winnie Mandela uh, smuggled a kid onto Robben Island to visit Mandela. Can you tell me that story? That day when Winnie Mandela arrived on the island, get off the ferry, I take her to the visit waiting room. There was a few other visitors with her. Then I see she take off the blanket, the raincoat, and I see she got a big backpack around her, at the back with a blanket around the middle. When she take that off, I observe she got a baby infant with her. And children was not allowed to the island. Prisoners is not allowed to see children. So I walked to her and I said to her, ma'am, we're supposed to cancel your visit. She begged me I must ask permission from my superiors, which I said I will find out. After that, we put the prisoners in a different cubicles. We collect the visitors. And when we bring the visitors in, we informed her to leave the baby in the waiting room with other visitors. She was still begging us, which the answer was no. But when she's in the cubicle, the steel panel opened between the double glass windows. And immediately when he started communicating with his other, she told her husband, Mandela, 
she brought his grandchild to Robin Island. That moment, Mandela looked back to me and he begged me. He said, please, Mr. Brandt, is it possible just to see the infant through the window? Which I said to him, Mandela, you know the prison regulations. You're not allowed to see a child. You can see that disappointment in his face when he carried on with his visit. And a while later, my superior passed. He touched my shoulder the back. He always warned us. And he tell us, we must tell our prisoners five minutes left of this visit. That moment when he formed Mandela about five minutes left of the visit, he looked back, he see my superior passed, and he begged me again, please, Mr. Brandt, just ask the warrant officer if it's possible if he can see my wife with a baby when he walked away from the building through one of these small windows. So I walked to my superior, asking what Mandela requested, and his answer to me was, he said, Brandt, if you can get hold of that baby without winning Mandela, no, we can show Mandela the child. So I walked back to Mandela and said, sorry, the answer is no. I closed the window and Winnie Mandela has been taken back to the waiting room. But that moment when Mandela stand up in his cubicle, he looked at his notes. He always have some notes and he said to me, Mr. Brandt, I forget something. Can you please pass a message to my wife? Tell her she must apply for visit for Christmas Day. That was more than six months in advance. That moment my superior is back in the visiting booth. Ask us, what is the delay? Why not bring out the prisoner? I explained him what Mandela requested and he said to me, Brandt fetch his wife back. Mandela sit down. Just one minute. I knew that moment the tape recorders were switched off. So they switched off all the cameras? The tape recorders, because we record everything by tape recorder. There was no cameras that year. So when I walked back to the waiting room, Winnie Mandela already had the baby infant in her arms. There was rotational visitors, and I walked straight to her and I said, Ma'am, can't I hold the baby? I never held the African child. She pushed it in my arms. She grabbed the handbag. She tried to bribe me of some money. I said, Ma'am, I don't want your money. I will just keep the baby for you, but please go back in the visiting booth. Because this visit is just one minute. She was still begging me, which the answer was no. But when she's in a visiting booth, I locked in and there was another door to lock. And I sneaked to the side of Mandela. After Mandela passed his message, my superior closed the window. Mandela seen me in a passage and he came straight to me. In that moment when he came to me, when he see the baby, there was tears in his eyes immediately. And then he started kissing the child. And then I become quite emotional. And that same moment, when Mandela knocked on the door, she's locked in. I quickly take the baby back from him go to her side, apologize, and gave her the infant back. She was still begging me to show him the child, which answer was no. But when she get to the mainland, the media tried to get a glimpse of her. They want information from the island. But at the same time, the police was waiting for her. She was under banning orders and the house arrest. But she managed to tell the media she smuggled this baby to Robin Island, but could have not show her husband on a distant. On the island, when I take Mandela back to his cell, he just thanked me what I've done. He didn't share it with his comrades. He was afraid... If that message leaked out, he should lose his studies, visits, and small privileges. I should have been charged, smuggled with a prisoner, which was called a terrorist, and the minimum sentence they promised our guards was five years. That secret was between me and Mandela for nearly 20 years. So why did you take that risk? You know, that day when I take the risk, I was just feeling as an old man. I just want to make his heart happy if he can touch his grandchild because I know grandparents is mad about grandchildren. And that was also convinced me, if I do that favor for him, he will always be also on my side. Understand me when I lock him up and sometimes criticize him for things. We will have some understanding between us, you know, and that secret was between us for nearly 20 years till he become the president of your country. And how did people find out about the story eventually? Eventually, I was in parliament that day. You were working in parliament? I was working in parliament with the Constitutional Assembly. And that morning, when I was also in the house delivering some documents to be tabled, Mandela observed me when he looked up and he sent his security to me. And the security come and fetch me. And that moment, he made the announcement to the public, to the people, what important person is this house today? I was so happy to see me. And he told them about the baby I smuggled for him when I was a prisoner on the Robben Island. So he kind of called everyone and mm. told the story. That must have been a beautiful moment. That was, I was really, I feel very small at that moment in that parliament. Uh, why did you feel small? Because all the eyes was on me. Everybody wanted to ask me after that, how did it happen? What happened? <laughs> Things like that. Yes. It must have felt amazing. And yeah. um, when was Nelson Mandela moved from Robben Island prison to Portsmouth prison? Nelson Mandela was moved in 1982. The 30th March 1982, he was moved to Portsmouth prison. And then from Portsmouth Prison, I was moved to Victor Vester Prison in December 1988. 
And then in 11 February 1990, he was released from there and we walked out of prison, yes. And why was he moved to Paul's Mall? Um, everybody is not sure about why he was being moved. But the speculations we heard, he was moved because he became too powerful on Robben Island. He was a person who gave a lot of advice for people. Prisoners come with advice. Prisoners want to see him. They want money. And through his wife, Winnie Mandela, and his lawyer, Ismail Ayob, a lot of funding was sent to Robben Island for different prisoners. And different other, some prisoners left their political parties to join up the ANC because the ANC support was they get money. And with money, they get education. And Mandela was one make sure to change the Robben Island into a university. He said himself, this is our university. And funding was come to Robben Island. But you know, there was also a plan of young prisoners wanting to escape from Robben Island. And Mandela was always struggling to get the prisoners under control and try to keep them happy and things like that. But we sent a message out to them. And that message, I understand, was on paper. And this message said, comrades, we never escape from this place. The longer we stay on this place, the more we can prepare us for freedom. We can educate ourselves. But remember, if we escape from this place and the police arrested us, we'll be tortured till death. How can you fight the struggle if you did? And how did you end up moving from Robben Island to Paul's Mall with Mandela? What happened? In 1982, I want to get married. In the, 12, uh, the 13th of March 1982, I want to get married. I was applying for transfers. They don't want to transfer me. Then I applied for a house on Robben Island because I get married that year. At that moment, they didn't have accommodation for me on the island. Then they said, well, temporary transfer me to Paul's Mall Prison. I arrived in Paul's Mall Prison, not realized they will also transfer Mandela and three others also to Paul's Mall Prison. So they was also sent there. And then I was called in, I was promoted to a sergeant, and then they put me also working on a section where Mandela was being kept. <clears throat> and I become in charge of his studies, his visits, his legal consultations, and all these things involved with the national intelligence, involved with security branch, take him out to hospitalization and things like that. And then later years, we also become involved where we take Mandela out to the minister's house for talks and discussions. Because Mandela made it sure he don't negotiate with government while I'm a prisoner. And then the minister said, it is not negotiation, we just talks and discussions. And that is where Mandela put pressure to government with our talks, released old sick prisoners, do better prison conditions. And with better prison conditions, they start giving televisions to prisons in prison. Prisoners get TV in better conditions, yes. And if I'm not mistaken, Nelson Mandela was offered the chance to be released from prison in 1985, and he declined because he wanted to be released with his comrades. And... Um, they, he, he was also saying, how can I negotiate when I'm a prisoner, you know? Um, so is, is that true? He, he, re that is he true. refused to be released. He refused to release. 1984, they gave Mandela an offer for release. And that offer was he must be deported out of the country to Transkai, which was our homeland of the Siskai. And he must stay there and he must renounce violence. And he said, I'm not the inner person for violence. I've never been sentenced for violence. Why must I renounce violence today? And my house in Johannesburg, if they release me in a trans guy, I'll walk to my home back in Johannesburg. You can put me back in jail. That was the first. Then they gave an offer for all political prisoners. Then nobody accepted except one guy. His name was Dennis Goldberg. And Dennis Goldberg was sentenced with Mandela for life. He was the only one who signed that offer and he was released and deported out of the country. So after that, they tried to convince Mandela on several occasions to accept the offer. Because the pressure from the outside world was so much on South Africa that you must release Mandela, but Mandela didn't accept it. And then when they come up with the releasing start, releasing prisoners, and they want to release Mandela, Mandela said, no, I don't want to be released. I want to see my comrades first out. I want to be the last one to be released. But then they start releasing prisoners in bulk. And with that, at that same time, they said, Mandela, you will be released on that day. And then he was released. And then they want to fly him to Johannesburg, Pretoria, to release him from Johannesburg to his home. He said, no, I was for 27 years in the Western Cape. I want to be released from the Western Cape. And I want to walk out of the prison where you kept me last, out of this prison. So he decided he want to walk out of prison, not to be released in Johannesburg. And he was moved from Robben Island to Paulsmoor. What was Paulsmoor like back in the day? Because now... Paulsmoor is known as one of the most notorious and dangerous prisons in the world. What were the conditions like back then? 
prison was still was that time the same type of prison, but Mandela and them was isolated alone on the roof of the maximum security prison, not mixed with other prisoners, totally kept alone. In that section, they've got a big cell for the five of them where it was fresh water, there was uh, warm water, there was uh, facilities for sports, there was a garden which Mandela had there. He was not part of the prison. Inside the prison was really bad with the criminals, but he was on the top of a roof section, totally separated from the whole prison community. I heard you say before that he was kind of in like this basement environment where it was very damp and um, it was probably better than Robben Island, but I mean, were the conditions not great? You know, after Mandela started talking to government in 1985, then they, they moved him to the basement section. <clears throat> that is after his prostate operation. They put him in a basement section. But while he was in that section, because of the dampness and everything, he was there. He get pneumonia. He ended up in, in Tigerberg Hospital. From Tigerberg Hospital, they sent him to Constantia Burke Medic Clinic for recovering. From there, they said they can't send him back to prison because government is busy talking to Mandela. They look for alternative place. They send him to Victor Vester, put him under a house arrest there. Still prison, but put him in a house where they got him in a house. And from there, he was released, yes. And before that, because he was in this, in this section, isolated with three other inmates, right? There was, there was four That's of them. Correct. Who were the other three? Okay, when Mandela was moved off the island, he was in Wim, Susulu, Mlangeni, and Mushlaba, the four main leaders of the ANC, the Ravonia trialist. But six months later, they sent another guy to, from the island because he take control over of Mandela, they say, on the island. He become famous in very strongly. He was the leader that was Ahmad Kathrada. after Mandela. He was also leader, but it was Ahmad Kathrada. They sent Ahmad Kathrada also to Portsmouth Prison. You know, and then in Portsmouth Prison, there was five of them was being kept there. And then there was another guy with him, Patrick Ntobeko Makobella. Makobella was sentenced with a group of prisoner people, and he was sent to Robben Island. But when he landed in the invocation office, they found out with the security branch background and everything, Makobella was a lawyer. And then immediately they said they can't put Marco Bella on the Robin Island. They put him with the elder people, Mandela. And then Mandela and others was worried. Why a young man came here? What reasons? They didn't knew Mandela. So when they have their secret walks and meetings, they try to keep it away from Marco Bella. Try to keep him busy somewhere else with somebody that is not part of the meetings. Till they could stood up, start trusted him. But after a few months, when they start trusted him, the Marco Bella was charged. They want to scrap him from the role as a lawyer. So we want to fight it back. So they transferred him back to Peter Maritzburg uh, prison and he was fighting his court case there. And when he won his case there, they didn't send him back to Polsmo prison. They sent him back to Pretoria prison. So he was kept in Pretoria till all political prisons was released. And it was Pretoria prison that the, the one that the movie was based on escaped from Pretoria. That's correct. The high level maximum security prison, which is a, another story that I would love to cover on this podcast about uh, guys that forged keys and um, escaped from Pretoria prison. It's an amazing movie with Daniel Radcliffe. Yes, and Tim Jenkins and that guy's. Yeah, it's fantastic. Have you I'm... met Tim Jenkins? No, I've never met he's any of them. He's in Cape Town somewhere. I'm not sure where now, but... Well, if you're he's... watching, I would love to meet you. <laughs> so, um, I mean, those four guys, you would think that they would want to keep them separate because they were four very powerful figures. What kind of... Were they able to have conversations with each other often? If they together, they can discuss things which is over the same discussion every time. But if this leadership can be with the younger prisoners of inside the prison... They can train others to become leaders and become chaos in a country when that young people can be released. So they try to keep them away from the normal younger generation that they isolate these old guys along. After a while, they don't know what they have to discuss. They never thought their discussion would become politicized, especially on Robin Island where different political people was kept in the same section with Mandela. But when they moved them to Portsmouth, there was only four leaders of the NC. It means with who can they discuss other things mm -hmm. except with four of them. So no matter what they discussed, it no. didn't really matter because it would never reach the outside world. That's correct. How did your relationship change with Mandela uh, from moving to, uh, from Robben Island to Paulsmore? Because I think I heard you say that the higher up guards couldn't just come into your section anytime they wanted. So you had a bit more freedom to interact with the other prisoners. That's correct. You know, in Paulsmore prison, we've got a list of guards which was allowed to enter the section. Not anyone can enter there because they must screen by security branch and the police forces and things like that. 
So when a guard opens a gate, we will first identify the guy. Not any official can just walk into the section and come and see Mandela. There was only certain people which was allowed. So we have control. And that control from the inside, nobody can enter from the outside. We start playing tennis with the prisoners. We start playing table tennis with the prisoners. And one day, one of the guards go and open a gate and he said, officers, he's coming. We were just dressed. <clears throat> and we were still smelling, you know, of sweat. Sweat was running off. It's hot on the roof where we play table tennis. And the officer said, oh, you are sweating. You get hot. I said, yes. Become very hot in the sun here. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't know we was playing tennis with the prisoners. Um, I know there's a story that on Christmas Eve, um, Nelson Mandela asked if they could celebrate Christmas. Can you tell me that story? You know, it was not Christmas Eve. I come back from my Christmas lunch. And that day when I opened a cell, Mandela was the first one who walked to me and said, Mr. Brandt, you know, we didn't get any visits the whole December month with our families. The police kept them away. But we also want to celebrate Christmas. I said, Mandela, how we want to celebrate that day, Christmas? He said, Mr. Brandt, if we can sit with U.S. guards around the table and enjoy some of our refreshments, we, that will be a celebration for us. So he wanted so, to sit down with the guards and have yes. dinner and so the other we agree. So we agree. There was coffee. There was oral schooling with water. There was fruitcake. There was dried fruit and there was some sweets. So some of the guards eat the sweets and dried fruit and we eat some fruitcake. But after the ceremony, I said to him, Mandela, it's the first time in my life I sit with a prisoner around the table. Everything was fine, but your fruitcake was very bad. Sorry, he said, Mr. Brandt, you forget something. You were the one who bought us the fruitcake. I said, Man Mandela, I knew I bought the fruitcake. But remember, this big shopping mall baked the fruitcake in bulk. They even baked the fruitcake for Muslim people, which shows halal on it. It means they want to celebrate Christmas with our Christians. But my wife baked fruitcake in October and she does it with brandies. I'll bring you a proper piece of fruitcake from home the next day. So next day I take him a piece of fruitcake from home. He enjoyed it. And the year after that, he applied for the fruitcake, dried fruit and some sweets. With that application, he said, Mr. Brandt, can you make sure the fruitcake is from your wife? I said to Mandela, that will be very difficult. I will see what I can do. I convinced my wife to bake fruitcake for other prison guards, not for prisoners. She baked and deducted money from the property. I paid her everything. She's happy. They are happy. Carry on year after year. But the year when Mandela was released from prison, he phoned at home. He thanked my wife for the fruitcake she provided him over the years. He, she didn't know what he was talking about. Till he started explaining about the moist fruitcake with the brandies in it. So then she understands he was baking for them. So she was baking fruitcake for them till they passed. So that night she made him fruitcake and he loved it so much that every year he wanted it until the day he died. That's correct. That's correct. She That's such a special story. Yeah. He passed. Not only for him, but also for Ahmed Katradra. When did negotiations start for his release? There was no negotiations for his release. You know, Mandela said he never negotiated while he's a prisoner. But they have talks and discussions. And Mandela just spell it out for them what the ANC stand for, fighting for, for release old sick prisoners, fighting for better prison conditions. Government decided themselves through Mandela that is the right time to uplift the bans on the ANC all the political parties. When that ban was uplifted, Mandela was released. Only after that, negotiations have happened, start happening in a country. I did. It was just preparations Mandela made for negotiations. I heard for the, prepara uh, for the preparations that they would smuggle him outside of prison without telling anyone, without telling the other prisoners, so that he could go have the meetings. No, there was no smuggled out of prison to have meetings. What happened, he was isolated alone. The other prisoners didn't know about it. So we take him out of prison legally to the minister's house where I have these meetings at night, sometimes in a day. So he was not smuggled out. On Paul's prison, I know we take him one day to a house there, Olosangun Obasanju from Nigeria, the eminent person group I visit South Africa. Mandela have met with these guys for two times, where these guys was also fighting for his release. And when he was released and announced that he was running for president, what was the reaction from people in the country? You know, people in the country was not positive about this, to have a black man as to be the president. But when Mandela walked in, he made it clear he put himself to deputy president, the clerk and Mbeki with him. Then people was feeling a little bit better. Mandela was more president who get investors back into South Africa, to get our debt to be lifted. He was more advertising South Africa for, for, for generations to come and things like that. But the other president was doing his job. Because there was a lot of sanctions placed on South Africa. I know that 
we were banned from sporting events. And one of the, the things that Nelson did to bring the country back together and kind of bring a positive spotlight on South Africa was the Rugby World Cup, which was the most beautiful and strategically planned thing I've ever seen. You know, the fact that um, we were banned and then he was released, becomes president and made this all happen. And then we win the World Cup. Um, I think that it couldn't have been a more perfectly timed event for the country because that must have just brought everyone back together. That's correct. You know, that day when Mandela walked onto that rugby field and he put it up, the apartheid jersey, the Springbok jersey, people was already celebrating Mandela. Mandela, they screaming out his name, Mandela. When we won the World Cup and he lifted up that whatever and things, people were so excited. All over in South Africa, black and white was harking each other, happy. We're winning as a nation, not as a color. We win as a nation, you know, the World Cup. And that bring people together. Mandela was a person, try on all events, even for sports, through music, try to reconcile people in South Africa, bring black and white together. He know the fears of the white people and he know how to calm down the white people, to accept black people also be part of the, of the new South Africa. One of the, the most beautiful moments in the Invictus movie was right as the, the finals of the World Cup started, um, there was two white police officers and a black homeless boy on the side of the road. And um, they were listening to it on the radio. And <laughs> at the beginning of the game, the boy was trying to listen to the radio and the police officers wouldn't let them come near the car to listen with them. And as the game progressed, you just see this boy, this homeless boy gets closer and closer to the car until the end where South Africa finally won. And you just see the cops and this boy celebrating together and like race just didn't matter. Um, and That's I mean, great. we've seen that in recent years as well, where uh, the Springboks won the World Cup, the last World Cup. That was also just such an amazing moment that, that brought the country together. That's correct. That was Mandela was a person bring people together in this country. You know, he was a person when he get money, he will help people with education, help programs in South Africa, help with the HIV programs. He get funding from America through Bill Clinton for HIV in South Africa, you know, to make sure that everybody with HIV in South Africa can have at least their tablets and medication. How did you feel? You've, you've seen this man over so many years going from a prisoner to becoming the president of South Africa. How did that make you feel seeing someone that you considered to be a friend accomplish something at such a high level? You know, I was very happy when he became president. I was excited. I could have said this was my student in <laughs> prison. He was my prisoner. And now he become the president. I feel very proud of that, that he become the president. You know, it was very excited for me. Excited moments. Even when I meet him in parliament for the first time, it was so difficult for me. I always said, Mandela, please come along and mention him. When I walked in, I must say, now President Mandela. You know, after a while we're talking, I forget about President. We still talk as normal as we were in prison. And you know, every time I meet him, he will ask me about my family, about my children, what guards is available, where's some of the guards, you know, where's this one, where's this one. He wanted to know and send him my greetings and things like that. There was a time he said, we must arrange a reunion with all the, all the guards which was close to him during that time. And we provide a name to him, we must... And we promised him we we're going to make a poiki course because we want to eat poiki course with us. But that time didn't come and didn't happen. And how do you think spending 27 years in prison changes him, changed the person, you know? You know, I think when he walked in prison, he was a militant person. He was a fighter. He was aggressive fighting the system, but he was oppressed him in this country. But he walked out with a changed mindset. You know, he walked out to understand white people better in the country. The fears of white people. Through me, he was also reach out and find out what is a fierce, what is a white people doing. The sports was loved, it's rugby and things like that. And that changed his mindset. When he walked out, he walked out with a mindset of reconciliation. He tried want to try to bring people together because he knew the outside world is watching us with a close eye. And he can reconcile people in the country. He can change the whole world. And he said, Mr. Brandt, how your kids can interact with different cultures. They learn their cultures. They can respect each other. If you go to different churches, you respect the different persons, religions. Then you can be peace in the world. And he said, if you can travel one day and you travel to different countries, go and travel and meet different cultures in different countries. 
eat their food, go to their places, understand how they operate. If you have an understanding of that person, you already have a friend. And through making friends with different cultures, is making peace in the world. He must have been so mentally strong because I once read somewhere that even spending something like 48 hours in isolation can change your mental state um, for the worse and irreversibly, you know, it can do irreversible damage. And to be in prison and be in isolation on and off for 27 years, I can't actually imagine how much strain that must have put on him. And he came out of prison, not only able to run the country, but as a better person than he went in. That's correct. Mandela was a person complained. We complained about lockdown in South Africa. I don't know <laughs> other countries. We complained about lockdown. To sit at home and locked up and could have not moved and visit people. Mandela was 27 years in lockdown. But his complaint was not about the, the things in lockdown. His complaint was that days were too short for him. There were so many things you want to fit into a day in prison, which you could have not fit in. The days were too short. He put his mind out to do something to keep his mind always occupied and busy. Even reading, studying, cleaning, working in his garden. But there was something he was also be kept himself busy. And um, I also heard that because I know education was so, so important for him. I heard that he offered to pay for your son's education. That's correct, yes. Can you tell me he about that? My, you know, my son was one of the first, second small children he met in prison in his cell. And he becomes so form of, uh, fond of my son. He always has sweets ready for him. <laughs> when he phoned at home, my son must always pick up the phone. And then always when he talked to my son, he talked about education. He must study hard to make his parents proud of himself. And many years later, I was visiting him one day, and he wrote a letter to me. And he said, Mr. Brandt, this letter you gave for your son, that is for his 16th birthday. So my son received a letter from him, congratulations on your 16th birthday. Through study to become the most important person of our country, one of the biggest leaders of South Africa, from Uncle Nelson. My son was very proud to receive that letter. But also, when Mandela contacted me one day, what your son want to study? And I said, I think you want to become a civil engineer. He gave him a scholarship in New York. Then my son didn't want to accept that. <laughs> but that not accept that, Mandela said, please bring the boy to me. I want to speak man on man with him. That day when I take my son to Mandela's house, they have a conversation. Mandela called me and he said, Mr. Brandt, we mustn't put our children in some directions. Children must decide for themselves. If your child, son want to become a commercial diver and he fail it and he don't want to do it and want to change his mind one day, children must learn through the mistakes. I will always be there for him to let him study. I will always be in charge giving him funding and things, scholarships. So my son go for the commercial diver's course. Through President Mandela. Imagine Nelson Mandela coming up to you. Well, you don't have to imagine. You've been through it. And saying, I'm willing to pay for your son's education to the best university or one of the best universities in New York. And he goes, no, thank you. I want to become a commercial diver. That's <laughs> <laughs> true, yes. And um, so I, I heard that your son also was diving on Robben Island at one point. That's correct. My son will start working his career with Maria Roberts, a company, and they got a tender on Robben Island, and my son was in charge of the diving team. So he worked on Robben Island till 2005. <clears throat> 2005, the site moved to the waterfront. He was working there one night late and things. He came late that evening. He was on a road. He was in a car accident. And on the way to the hospital, my son had passed. Without me informed Mandela about the death of my son, he was the one who phoned me the next morning. I was on the way to the hospital to identify his body. And he said to me, Mr. Brandt, a parent must never lose a child. And he started explaining me how he felt when he was a prisoner on Robben Island, when he lost his eldest son, Tim McKeel himself, in a car accident. How bad it was for him. He could have not attended a funeral. He could have not write a letter to his son. His son was not allowed to visit him. He could have not say goodbye to his son the day when he was sentenced. And now he lost his son. How bad it was for him. Then he said to me, Mr. Brandt, I would love to attend your son's funeral but I'm only back in two weeks in South Africa. I said, President Mandela, the funeral will be within three to four working days. I really respect that you phoned me. Thanks for that. I know in your heart you will be with us as a family. But that day of the funeral, Ahmed Kathrada was there, one of his comrades in the Ravonia trial, Barbara Hogan, two people from parliament, 
few lot of stuff from Robin Island was attending my son's funeral. The priest was supposed to do the service, church service in Dutch, but when he observed his people from Parliament and things, he immediately changed the whole th- story and he started speaking, speaking in English and Afrikaans to accommodate everybody. Church was too small that day to accommodate everybody. I was well supported. And two weeks after that, Mandela have invited me. I must come and see him urgent. And that day we have a long conversation with us again about children. And after the conversation, he said to me, Brandt, I realize we both come from the rural areas. We both land in a city of apartheid. We both land on Robin and me as a prisoner, you as a guard. We both lost our eldest son. I want you to write a book about our relationship. And I said to him, President Mandela, I'm not interested to write a book. He put so much pressure to me for six years. There was a lady come to help me. Her name is Barbara Jones from the UK. She was working for the Mail on Sunday. And she had a contract for six months to finalize my book. So she take all my manuscripts and things, and she sat with me and she speak to Kathradra and people, and they start compiling my book together. When my book was nearly ready, Mandela had passed, and I was invited to the funeral. And six months, uh, sorry, three months after the funeral, I was invited for my book launch in the UK. And that evening, Zinzi Mandela pitched up. And she said to me, Mr. Brandt, you can't run away from me. My last promise to my dad was, he said, if he can't attend your book launch, I must represent him. So my book was very well received in the UK. And then my book was launched in, in Constitution Hill with Ahmad Khatradra. And then I launched my book in New Mass, Boston, and America. So my book was called Mandela, My Prisoner, My Friend. Amazing. And um, just coming towards the end, when was the last time you saw Mandela? That was about three months, no, about six months before he passed. You know, he was still okay. And just after that, he was in hospital. And then he came out of hospital. Then he was back in hospital. Then he was invited to come and see him on a certain day with a Ravonia trialist. And then Ahmed Khatrada explained me, you've got pipes, mouthpiece, all these things, you know. So he was and very sick very at that sick. time. And then I said, I not really want to fly up to Johannesburg to come and see the old man. I would really want to remember him like I've seen him the last time when he was still laughing at me. So I didn't go. Then I was invited, like I said, to the funeral also. And what was the funeral service like? Funeral service was very sad, but I was feel happy. Mandela have achieved what he wanted to do in life. He laid a foundation for the new South Africa. I was very happy for that. He has seen his freedom. He has become the president. He could have retired. He could have been with his children and grandchildren. I was happy for that. And then he passed. It means he has a full life. And I think... Like I said, the more you help people around you, the more you will be blessed with good life. And I believe he was blessed with good life after his release. I mean, I was reading last night and an article was saying that they don't think there's been a person in history that has received more awards than Nelson Mandela. You know, to think about, he spent so much time behind bars. And I know during that time, he was preparing for what he was going to do. I mean, that must have been the longest planning of anyone in history to do something. Um, And when he got outside, he just accomplished so much in such a short period of time because he he wasn't outside for that that long, hey, like six six to ten years or how long was from his release until his death? How long did he have? Till it it passed. Yeah. Oh, he was he was released in 1990 and 2013. He passed. 20 odd years. Okay, that's a that's a good amount of time. It was quite a good (laughs) amount of years. Yeah, ten years. Anyway, thank you so much for coming down and chatting with me on the podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. And thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Wide Awake Podcast. And I'll see you all very soon. Cheers. Yes.